an alpine divorce. In some natures, there are no half tones, nothing but raw primary colors. John Bodman was a man who was always at one extreme or the other. This probably would have mattered little had he not married a wife whose nature was an exact duplicate of his own. Doubtless there exists in this world precisely the right woman for any given man to marry, and vice versa. But when you consider that a human being has the opportunity of being acquainted with only a few hundred people, and out of the few hundred, that there are but a dozen or less whom he knows intimately, and out of the dozen, one or two friends at most, it will easily be seen, when we remember the number of millions who inhabit this world, that probably, since the earth was created, the right man has never yet met the right woman. The mathematical chances are all against such a meeting, and this is the reason that divorce courts exist. Marriage, at best, is but a compromise, and if two people happen to be united who are of an uncompromising nature, there is trouble. In the lives of these two young people, there was no middle distance. The result was bound to be either love or hate, and in the case of Mr. and Mrs. Bodman, it was hate of the most bitter and arrogant kind. In some parts of the world, incompatibility of temper is considered a just cause for obtaining a divorce, but in England, no such subtle distinction is made, and so, until the wife became criminal, or the man became both criminal and cruel, these two were linked together by a bond that only death could sever. Nothing can be worse than this state of things, and the matter was only made the more hopeless by the fact that Mrs. Bodman lived a blameless life, and her husband was no worse, but rather better than the majority of men. Perhaps, however, that statement held only up to a certain point, for John Bodman had reached a state of mind in which he resolved to get rid of his wife at all hazards. If he had been a poor man, he would probably have deserted her. But he was rich, and a man cannot freely leave a prospering business because his domestic life happens not to be happy. When a man's mind dwells too much on any one subject, no one can tell just how far he will go. The mind is a delicate instrument, and even the law recognizes that it is easily thrown from its balance. Bodman's friends, for he had friends, claimed that his mind was unhinged, but neither his friends nor his enemies suspected the truth of the episode, which turned out to be the most important, as it was the most ominous, event in his life. Whether John Bodman was sane or insane at the time he made up his mind to murder his wife will never be known, but there was certainly craftiness in the method he devised to make the crime appear the result of an accident. Nevertheless, cunning is often a quality in a mind that has gone wrong. Mrs. Bodman well knew how much her presence afflicted her husband, but her nature was as restless as his, and her hatred of him was, if possible, more bitter than his hatred of her. Wherever he went, she accompanied him, and perhaps the idea of murder would never have occurred to him if she had not been so persistent in forcing her presence upon him at all times and on all occasions. So when he announced to her that he intended to spend the month of July in Switzerland, she said nothing, but made her preparations for the journey. On this occasion he did not protest, as was usual with him, and so to Switzerland the silent couple departed. There is a hotel near the mountain tops, which stands on a ledge over one of the great glaciers. It is a mile and a half above the level of the sea, and it stands alone, reached by a toilsome road that zigzags up the mountain for six miles. 
There is a wonderful view of snow peaks and glaciers from the verandas of this hotel, and in the neighborhood are many picturesque walks to points more or less dangerous. John Bodman knew the hotel well, and in happier days he had been intimately acquainted with the vicinity. Now that the thought of murder arose in his mind, a certain spot two miles distant from this inn continually haunted him. It was a point of view overlooking everything, and its extremity was protected by a low and crumbling wall. He arose one morning at four o'clock, slipped unnoticed out of the hotel, and went to this point, which was locally named the Hanging Outlook. His memory had served him well. It was exactly the spot, he said to himself. The mountain which rose up behind it was wild and precipitous. There were no inhabitants near to overlook the place. The distant hotel was hidden by a shoulder of rock. The mountains on the other side of the valley were too far away to make it possible for any casual tourist or native to see what was going on on the hanging outlook. Far down in the valley, the only town in view seemed like a collection of little toy houses. One glance over the crumbling wall at the edge was generally sufficient for a visitor or even the strongest nerves. There was a sheer drop of more than a mile straight down, and at the distant bottom were jagged rocks and stunted trees that looked in the blue haze like shrubbery. This is the spot, the man said to himself, and tomorrow morning is the time. John Bodman had planned his crime as grimly and relentlessly and as coolly as ever he had concocted a deal on the stock exchange. There was no thought in his mind of mercy for his unconscious victim. His hatred had carried him far. The next morning after breakfast, he said to his wife, I intend to take a walk in the mountains. Do you wish to come with me? Yes, she answered briefly. Very well, then, he said. I shall be ready at nine o'clock. I shall be ready at nine o'clock, she repeated after him. At that hour, they left the hotel together to which he was shortly to return alone. They spoke no word to each other on their way to the hanging outlook. The path was practically level, skirting the mountains, for the hanging outlook was not much higher above the sea than the hotel. John Bodman had formed no fixed plan for his procedure when the place was reached. He resolved to be guided by circumstances, now and then a strange fear arose in his mind that she might cling to him and possibly drag him over the precipice with her. He found himself wondering whether she had any premonition of her fate, and one of his reasons for not speaking was the fear that a tremor in his voice might possibly arouse her suspicions. He resolved that his action should be sharp and sudden, that she might have no chance either to help herself or to drag him with her. Of her screams in that desolate region, he had no fear. No one could reach the spot except from the hotel, and no one that morning had left the house, even for an expedition to the glacier, one of the easiest and most popular trips from the place. Curiously enough, when they came within sight of the hanging outlook, Mrs. Bodman stopped and shuddered. Bodman looked at her through the narrow slits of his veiled eyes and wondered again if she had any suspicion. No one can tell when two people walk closely together what unconscious communication one mind may have with another. What is the matter? he asked gruffly. Are you tired? John, she cried, with a gasp in her voice, calling him by his Christian name for the first time in years. Don't you think that if you had been kinder to me at first, things might have been different? 
It seems to me, he answered, not looking at her, that it is rather late in the day for discussing that question. I have much to regret, she said quaveringly. Have you nothing? No, he answered. Very well, replied his wife, with the usual hardness returning to her voice. I was merely giving you a chance. Remember that. Her husband looked at her suspiciously. What do you mean, he asked, giving me a chance? I want no chance, nor anything else from you. A man accepts nothing from one he hates. My feeling toward you is, I imagine, no secret to you. We are tied together, and you have done your best to make the bondage insupportable. Yes, she answered with her eyes on the ground. We are tied together. We are tied together. She repeated these words under her breath as they walked the few remaining steps to the outlook. Bodman sat down upon the crumbling wall. The woman dropped her alpenstock on the rock and walked nervously to and fro, clasping and unclasping her hands. Her husband caught his breath as the terrible moment drew near. Why do you walk about like a wild animal? he cried. Come here and sit down beside me and be still. She faced him with a light he had never before seen in her eyes, a light of insanity and of hatred. I walk like a wild animal, she said, because I am one. You spoke a moment ago of your hatred of me, but you are a man, and your hatred is nothing to mine. Bad as you are, much as you wish to break the bond which ties us together, there are still things which I know you would not stoop to. I know there is no thought of murder in your heart, but there is in mine. I will show you, John Bodman, how much I hate you. The man nervously clutched the stone beside him and gave a guilty start as she mentioned murder. Yes, she continued, I have told all my friends in England that I believed you intended to murder me in Switzerland. Good God, he cried, how could you say such a thing? I say it to show how much I hate you how much I am prepared to give for revenge. I have warned the people at the hotel, and when we left, two men followed us. The proprietor tried to persuade me not to accompany you. In a few moments, those two men will come in sight of the outlook. Tell them, if you think they will believe you, that it was an accident. The mad woman tore from the front of her dress shreds of lace and scattered them around. Bodman started up to his feet, crying, What are you about? But before he could move toward her, she precipitated herself over the wall and went shrieking and whirling down the awful abyss. The next moment, two men came hurriedly around the edge of the rock and found the man standing alone. Even in his bewilderment, he realized that if he told the truth, he would not be believed. Which was the murderer? Mrs. John Forder had no premonition of evil. When she heard the hall clock strike nine, she was blithely singing about the house as she attended to her morning duties, and she little imagined that she was entering the darkest hour of her life, and that before the clock struck again, overwhelming disaster would have fallen upon her. Her young husband was working in the garden, as was his habit each morning before going to his office. She expected him in every moment to make ready for his departure downtown. She heard the click of the front gate, and a moment later, some angry words. Alarmed, she was about to look through the parted curtains of the bay window in front, when the sharp crack of a revolver rang out, 
and she hastened to the door with a vague sinking fear at her heart. As she flung open the door, she saw two things. First, her husband lying face downwards on the grass, motionless, his right arm doubled under him. Second, a man trying frantically to undo the fastening of the front gate with a smoking pistol still in his hand. Human lives often hang on trivialities. The murderer, in his anxiety to be undisturbed, had closed the front gate tightly. The wall was so high as to shut out observation from the street, but the height that made it difficult for an outsider to see over it also rendered escape impossible. If the man had left the gate open, he might have got away unnoticed, but as it was, Mrs. Forder's screams aroused the neighborhood, and before the murderer succeeded in undoing the fastening, a crowd had collected with the policeman in its center, and escape was out of the question. Only one shot had been fired, but at such close quarters that the bullet went through the body. John Forder was not dead, but lay on the grass insensible. He was carried into the house and the family physician summoned. The doctor sent for a specialist to assist him, and the two men consulted together. To the distracted woman, they were able to give small comfort. The case at best was a doubtful one. There was some hope of ultimate recovery, but very little. Meanwhile, the murderer lay in custody, his own fate depending much on the fate of his victim. If Forder died, bail would be refused. If he showed signs of recovering, his assailant had a chance for at least temporary liberty. No one in the city, unless it were the wife herself, was more anxious for Forder's recovery than the man who had shot him. The crime had its origin in a miserable political quarrel, mere wrangle about offices. Walter Radner, the assassin, had claims upon an office, and, rightly or wrongly, he attributed his defeat to the secret machinations of John Forder. He doubtless did not intend to murder his enemy that morning when he left home, but heated words had speedily followed the meeting, and the revolver was handy in his hip pocket. Radner had a strong political backing, and even after he stretched his victim on the grass, he had not expected to be so completely deserted when the news spread through the city. Life was not then so well protected as it has since become, and many a man who walked the streets free had, before that time, shot his victim. But in this case, the code of assassination had been violated. Radner had shot down an unarmed man in his own front garden and almost in sight of his wife. He gave his victim no chance. If Forder had had even an unloaded revolver in any of his pockets, things would not have looked so black for Radner, because his friends could have held that he had fired in self-defense, as they would doubtless claim that the dying man had been the first to show a weapon. So Radner, in the city prison, found that even the papers of his own political party were against him, and that the town was horrified at what it considered a cold-blooded crime. As time went on, Radner and his few friends began once more to hope. Forder still lingered between life and death. That he would ultimately die from his wound was regarded as certain, but the law required that a man should die within a stated time after the assault had been committed upon him, otherwise the assailant could not be tried for murder. The limit provided by the law was almost reached, and Forder still lived. Time also worked in Radner's favor in another direction. The sharp indignation that had followed the crime had become dulled. Other startling events occurred which usurped the place held by the Forder tragedy, and Radner's friends received more and more encouragement.
Mrs. Forder nursed her husband assiduously, hoping against hope. They had been married less than a year, and their love for each other had increased as time went on. Her devotion to her husband had now become almost fanatical, and the physicians were afraid to tell her how utterly hopeless the case was, fearing that if the truth became known to her, she would break down both mentally and physically. Her hatred of the man who had wrought this misery was so deep and intense that once she spoke of him to her brother, who was a leading lawyer in the place, he saw with grave apprehension the light of insanity in her eyes. Fearful for a breakdown in health, the physicians insisted that she should walk for a certain time each day, and as she refused to go outside of the gate, she took her lonely promenade up and down a long path in the deserted garden. One day she heard a conversation on the other side of the wall that startled her. That is the house, said a voice, where Forder lives, who was shot by Walter Radner. The murder took place just behind this wall. Did it really? queried a second voice. I suppose Radner is rather an anxious man this week. Oh, said the first, he has doubtless been anxious enough all along. True, but still, if Forder lives the week out, Radner will escape the gallows. If Forder were to die this week, it would be rather rough on his murderer, for his case would come up before Judge Brent who is known all over the state as a hanging judge. He has no patience with crimes growing out of politics, and he is certain to charge dead against Radner and carry the jury with him. I tell you that the man in jail will be the most joyous person in this city on Sunday morning if Forder is still alive, and I understand his friends have bail ready and that he will be out of jail first thing Monday morning. The two unseen persons, having now satisfied their curiosity by their scrutiny of the house, passed on and left Mrs. Forder standing looking into space, with her nervous hands clasped tightly together. Coming to herself, she walked quickly to the house and sent a messenger for her brother. He found her pacing up and down the room. How is John today? he said. Still the same, still the same, was the answer. It seems to me he is getting weaker and weaker. He does not recognize me any more. What do the doctors say? Oh, how can I tell you? I don't suppose they speak the truth to me, but when they come again, I shall insist upon knowing just what they think. But tell me this. Is it true that if John lives through the week, his murderer will escape? How do you mean escape? Is it the law of the state that if my husband lives till the end of this week, the man who shot him will not be tried for murder? He will not be tried for murder, said the lawyer, but he may not be tried for murder even if John were to die now. His friends will doubtless try to make it out a case of manslaughter as it is, or perhaps they will try to get him off on the ground of self-defense. Still, I don't think they would have much of a chance, especially as his case will come before Judge Brent. But if John lives past 12 o'clock on Saturday night, it is the law of the state that Radner cannot be tried for murder. Then, at most, he will get a term of years in a state prison. But that will not bother him to any great extent. He has a strong political backing, and if his party wins the next state election, which seems likely, the governor will doubtless pardon him out before a year is over. Is it possible, cried the wife, that such an enormous miscarriage of justice can take place in a state that pretends to be civilized? The lawyer shrugged his shoulders. I don't bank much on our civilization, he said. 
Such things occur every year and many times a year. The wife walked up and down the room while her brother tried to calm and soothe her. It is terrible, it is awful, she cried, that such a dastardly cry may go unavenged. My dear sister, said the lawyer, do not let your mind dwell so much on vengeance. Remember that whatever happens to the villain who caused all this misery, it can neither help nor injure your husband. Revenge, cried the woman, suddenly turning upon her brother. I swear before God that if that man escapes, I will kill him with my own hand. The lawyer was too wise to say anything to his sister in her present frame of mind, and after doing what he could to comfort her, he departed. On Saturday morning, Mrs. Forder confronted the physicians. I want to know, she said, and I want to know definitely whether there is the slightest chance of my husband's recovery or not. This suspense is slowly killing me, and I must know the truth, and I must know it now. The physicians looked one at the other. I think, said the elder, that it is useless to keep you longer in suspense. There is not the slightest hope of your husband's recovery. He may live for a week or for a month, perhaps, or he may die at any moment. I thank you, gentlemen, said Mrs. Forder, with a calmness that astonished the two men, who knew the state of excitement she had labored under for a long time past. I thank you. I think it is better that I should know. All the afternoon she sat by the bedside of her insensible and scarcely breathing husband. His face was wasted to a shadow from his long contest with death. The nurse begged permission to leave the room for a few minutes, and the wife, who had been waiting for this, silently assented. When the woman had gone, Mrs. Fowler, with tears streaming from her eyes, kissed her husband. John, she whispered, you know and you will understand. She pressed his face to her bosom, and when his hand fell back on the pillow, her husband was smothered. Mrs. Forder called for the nurse and sent for the doctors, but that which had happened was only what they had all expected. To a man in the city jail, the news of Forder's death brought a wild thrill of fear. The terrible and deadly charge of Judge Brent against the murderer doomed the victim, as every listener in the courthouse realized as soon as it was finished. The jury were absent but ten minutes, and the hanging of Walter Radner did more, perhaps, than anything that ever happened in the state to make life within that commonwealth more secure than it had been before.